Well, hello, everybody. Uh, well, the rest of you coming in, come to the front of the room, please, as we always say at press conferences. <laughs> get closer to your screens. Uh, get your earbuds in. Uh, I am Ian Williams, president of the Foreign Press Association in New York, and it is a pleasure and an honour yet again to have our guests Tony Dottora and John Mankins uh, speaking with us here today. And you know, as California suffers from us uh, and the West Coast suffers from a somewhat excess of solar energy, we're still choking on the smoke over here in New York from the fires. Um, they are talking. They are talking about the serious project of harnessing solar energy and directing it to Earth. Uh, no messy photovoltaic panels across the desert. No messing up deserts with um, solar arrays. And I think it's th th this should be pollution free, but it's how far is it Star Wars? I mean, I was going to ask them <laughs> what, if they could sell it as a weapon, they get the money right away. <laughs> if you could promise a death ray, the Doctor the, the Doctor No style to slice planets in uh, slice islands in half, you might stand a chance of getting funding. But they think seem to think it's a commercial enterprise, and more to the point is. So do the British, the Japanese, and the Chinese, all of whom have programs. So the, the uh, various ducks, you might say, are all coming in a row where uh, we've got the launch capability, the delivery capability, and the technology to do this. And the key point is, of course, in space, you don't have to go dark at night. The sun is there all the time if you put it in the right place. And so we want to discuss this with them. Um, they're about to launch a report on it. Tony Dottore is president of the Beyond Earth Institute, which specializes in trying to get, to get to look up and get a better horizon out of things. And John Mankins has actually worked on it with the JPL, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, Laboratory with NASA and others. So uh, Tony, I believe you're going to launch in and tell us, throw some light on the situation, you might say. Very good, Ian. Thank you very much. Yes, my name is Tony DiTora. I'm Vice President for Policy Coherence at the Beyond Earth Institute. And uh, we set up Beyond Earth to focus on the legal and policy framework, enabling or preventing, in the other case, communities beyond Earth. And um, we believe that the subject of today's event, space solar power, enables communities beyond Earth. But it also serves other significant near-term, mid-term, and long-term policy goals. So I'd now like to introduce actually John Mankins, who's an advisor to the Beyond Earth Institute and a renowned expert in space solar power. Thank you very much, Tony. So uh, it's a pleasure to be with you uh, today for what we hope will be a, uh, uh, a fruitful discussion and uh, an opportunity to kick off uh, even a, a larger discussion about space, solar power, and the U.S. Uh, the argument uh, being put forward is that it is now time for the U.S. to lead the commercial and civil uh, development of space, solar power. So why is this the case? Well, frankly, the world has an urgent need for new energy solutions. Uh, I have here a, a map of the of the world uh, with the various uh, individual countries grouped into uh, large blocks, a little bit different than what you may have seen uh, previously. Uh, uh, the Northern Oceanic Block, which is the US, uh, Europe, uh, Japan, Canada, Mexico, Australia, New Zealand, it's about a billion people. And they use about 58,000 kilowatt hours per person per year. And over the next 50 or 60 or 70 years, the population of this region is relatively stable with only modest growth anticipated. Uh, then there's Eurasia, which is uh, uh, Western Asia, Northern Asia, um, comprising about a billion people. It's not quite as much energy. It's about 19,000 kilowatt hours per year. But again, this region is projected by the UN to be relatively stable over the coming century, the rest of this century. China, taking it as a region in and of itself, is about one and a half billion, 
uh, but as you may have seen in recent press accounts, is forecast to actually reduce in population over the next several decades. Uh, and it currently has about 26,000 kilowatt hours per person. These are all fairly substantial and fairly viable numbers, both today and looking forward. However, for Mediterranean Africa and the Middle East, it's about a half a billion. And although it has 27,000 kilowatt hours per person, which is a lot of energy per year, uh, it's slated to grow by almost 400 millions by the end of the century. And as a consequence, all of those people will need energy. Uh, the rest of the world, India, Southeast Asia and Oceania, Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America are all in much worse straits with regard to the energy which is available today per capita. And several of these regions, in particular Sub-Saharan Africa, is projected to grow from about 1 billion to 3.7 billion by the end of this century. And they are the worst in that they only have, they have less than 6,000 kilowatt hours, approximately 10% of these countries I described as the Northern Oceanic countries uh, in terms of the energy per capita. So not only are they at the bottom of the heap in terms of available energy, they are projected to grow by a factor of three or more over the coming four decades, five decades. And as a consequence, not only in looking for new energy solutions and ones that will address climate concerns and be carbon zero over the next several decades for the current major economies, in addition, we have to think about sustainable energy for some six billions of people by 2100 in these, what I'm characterizing as emerging economies. And this, this means that in the context of climate, uh, or even without climate concerns, there is a, a drastic need for a better quality of life for billions and billions of people, some of whom are being born over the coming decades. And if we're going to achieve a climate solution, then we need new energy options, as well as those that we are currently pursuing. So what is the vision of space solar power in this context? Well, it's the idea of affordable and relocatable solar power available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, every year, all the time, forever, at least for the next uh, 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 billion years or so. Uh, the energy from a solar power satellite can be delivered in a variety of locations around the world if the satellite is placed in a high uh, Earth orbit and with sunlight available essentially all of the time, as Ian mentioned. This is how it would work. The source is obviously the sun. Uh, in space, there would be a platform that would harvest the sunlight. It's large because sunlight is at relatively uh, low intensity, about uh, 1,368 watts per square meter on average. Uh, the energy once harvested would be converted into electricity from electricity into a microwave wireless power transmission, which would then be sent to ground stations around the globe uh, and fed into existing infrastructures to drive homes and businesses. And we see space solar power as a complement to sustainable terrestrial uh, energy solutions playing a role uh, by the latter part of this decade comparable to the role which is now being played by fossil fuel sources such as natural gas uh, or provided by hydro sources which are being impacted very negatively by ongoing drought. If you're a little concerned about the physics of space solar power, uh, this is an end-to-end -end demonstration done by some interns for Dr. Paul Jaffe of the Naval Research Laboratory uh, and illustrating that the uh, physics of space solar power can be dealt with essentially on a tabletop for a few hundreds of dollars in a couple of months um, and compare this to other major uh, new energy options, uh, for example, such as uh, thermonuclear fusion, uh, which is uh, uh, demanded decades and decades and hundreds and hundreds of, of millions of dollars, billions of dollars to get to a proof of the physics. So the physics of space solar power is well-established. 
There are some major hurdles that have been barriers to the realization of space solar power that have only been overcome in the last half dozen years or so. Uh, one of these is the question of launch cost. How much does it cost to get the hardware from space to the ground? Historically, the cost of government launches uh, for 20, 40, 60 years has been on the order of $20,000 a kilogram. Uh, and this was uh, be believed to be almost an immutable fact. With the advent of the Falcon 9 reusable and the coming uh, new systems of the Starship and the Starship Heavy Booster the, uh, from SpaceX and Blue Origin's new Glenn launcher and other launch systems that are now being developed by other countries, once reusable launch systems have been proven, which they have, the cost of launch has already come down by 90% from where it was only uh, six or eight years ago. This is a huge change in the economics of space solar power, but it's not the most important one. In addition, the cost of space hardware has been, per, has been much too high, 50,000, $100,000, $200,000 a kilogram. Uh, the most recent uh, rover that the U.S. put on Mars, the Perseverance rover, is a million dollars a kilogram. If you had to spend that kind of money, you would never be able to do anything huge like a solar power satellite, be, be unimaginable. However, a recent project, one of several, to develop large-scale, modular, and mass-produced mega constellations has proven that it is possible to manufacture spacecrafts in the thousands at radically lower costs. In particular, the, uh, and there's uh, not only the uh, Starlink that I'm uh, referring to the numbers on, there's also the Kuiper system, there's the OneWeb and so on. Uh, these systems are uh, coming in at something like $2,000 per kilogram versus $200,000 per kilogram. So this represents a 99% reduction in the cost of hardware, space hardware, if you have a design, if you have an architecture that allows you to mass produce the system in factories like consumer electronics, uh, like uh, uh, the jet engines for aircraft and so on. Very advanced, very sophisticated, advanced materials, advanced electronics, but still 99% below the cost of traditional spacecraft systems. So between these two, 90% reduction in the cost of the, the launch, 99% reduction in the cost of the hardware, all of a sudden, big systems like solar power satellites start to become doable. And this is the key point that I think is driving uh, increased interest in space solar power internationally. So there's a particular kind of modular system. Obviously, you can do launch in lots of ways. You can do space solar power in lots of ways. There's a class of systems which supports these features, in particular, the mass production of modular components. Uh, the SPS Alpha, S solar power satellite by means of arbitrarily large array, is one such system in which you make an exceptionally large platform out of a very large number of smaller modular units uh, on the order of um, uh, CubeSats or 3U, that's a three size, uh, three times a regular size CubeSat or larger, and in which you would make literally thousands or tens of thousands of identical modules, which would then be put together robotically in space to become the large mass produced solar power satellite. This approach, this concept, lends itself to a tractable, fast-paced roadmap for the emergence of commercial and civil space solar power uh, by the U led by the U.S., working with private sector partners in the U.S. and private and uh, uh, government partners internationally. Uh, so the line of argument, the belief is, and this can be tested readily in just a few years, that within the next handful of years, we could establish the technical foundation for these very large modular space systems that we could develop and demonstrate the key technologies. By the mid to late 2020s, i.e. within five or seven years, 
We could resolve key regulatory matters such as spectrum allocation and do the first demonstrations of a, an operational solar power satellite in low earth orbit. And by the late 2020s, i.e. before this decade is out, that a full scale solar power satellite delivering tens, to a, tens of megawatts to 100 megawatts could be developed and deployed in space validating not only the system, but the full-scale economics and establishing this, establishing this as a major new tool in addressing the goals of carbon net zero energy. In closing, I would just highlight that, that space solar power is a viable technical option and that the US working with others can develop this vitally needed approach to addressing carbon zero energy, and that it can be done, if we do it the right way, it can be done within this decade. Tony, thank you, and I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, John. Very interesting, compelling uh, presentation there. And now I'll uh, bring up my own slides which I am at the actual end of, perfect. So let me, <laughs> give me a <coughs> second. Okay. Love it when a plan comes together here, all right. So, so John just said we can develop this vitally needed option for carbon zero energy, but how? How can the US do this within this decade? So the Biden-Harris administration can, and we suggest they should, establish a national strategy to ensure the development and use of space solar power systems to achieve the objectives of the United States. The National Space Council, as you may be aware, issues space policy directives. These are setting broad national goals which encompass multiple agencies across the federal government. They outline responsibilities, they establish roadmaps, and we think this is the perfect approach to establishing uh, space solar power as a national goal and to, for outlining the process moving forward. So we wanna use the space policy directive to use space assets to provide the ultimate green power source. Now, the key officials for space solar power on the National Space Council, the council itself is made up of senior administrative, senior administration officials. The vice president will obviously be key. She chairs the uh, National Space Council itself. Secretary of State, we have large international um, interests and uh, issues here. NASA administrator, obviously you're taking place in space, plus we have space goals that can be enabled by this type of power source. Secretary of Energy, Obviously, you could not do this sort of power system without the Secretary of Energy's involvement and the entire department. Secretary of Defense, uh, we were talking earlier uh, about the Department of Defense has several demonstration technology development issues, uh, sorry, programs, and um, those are interesting and they're making progress, but their goal is not to achieve a commercially usable um, broad. Uh, system for power generation. Department of Defense has some very specific needs, primarily off-grid where space solar power makes sense to them. We need a broader program. Secretary of Commerce and Secretary of Transportation. So the policy statement we would like the uh, government to make is space solar power is vital to meeting the climate, national security, commercial, space exploration, and space science objectives of the United States. And you heard John talk briefly about the climate. I mean, I think we all understand what fossil fuels are doing. Uh, national security, touched on that with the Department of Defense. And then these other, ob other um, objectives, they're critically important to the future of our country. So the national policy approach would be to pursue development, demonstration, and use. John outlined some demonstration projects, but they ultimately need to be used in a commercial way. So a viable net zero carbon terrestrial energy option by the late 2020s within a decade. 
cooperating with commercial and international partners is going to be critical to achieving America's strategic objectives here. Uh, commercial operations tend to do things more efficiently, engaging with them, make sure that you're focused on the right things to bring that to actual full use. And working with international partners, obviously we're looking for solutions for the world, not just for the United States. So the principles, the United States will adhere to the principles of safety. We want to make sure that the system from end to end is safe for people, for animals, for aircraft, for everything it comes into contact with. I think John outlined some of that, but the systems are designed such that they will be safe. And then obviously you need security, cybersecurity, operational security, and sustainability. One of the things you don't want to do is push the world's problems off into space. So there is a new focus on space sustainability in the same way that in the a few decades ago, people started to become aware of Earth's environment and the, the total of human activity and what it was doing. So by pursuing development demonstration and use of SSP, we can adhere to these principles and achieve the goals. So let's talk about the goals just briefly. Goal A is to develop this near continuous dispatchable baseload scale net zero carbon power to markets on earth. Now baseload scale is what's needed on the grid at any moment. And dispatchable means you can send it where it needs to be, which means there are some power operations that aren't on the grid, but still require power. And our system could also use, could serve those needs. But we wanna maximize international adoption. We wanna maximize private sector adoption and we wanna minimize cost. So those all need to be in that goal. Our second goal is to develop a suitable uh, system for lunar and planetary surface and in space power needs. So that would also enable the range of terrestrial applications, but also space applications and including future commercial space applications. Goal C is to establish the technical foundations and capabilities to meet those future terrestrial commercial needs, the commercial space needs, as well as the mission requirements for NASA and DOD. Goal D is demonstrate that space solar power system. And this is a proposal uh, on the surface of the moon that's scalable to one megawatt electric. A second demonstration would be in Earth orbit to deliver a 100 megawatt electric to terrestrial markets, perhaps scalable up to one gigawatt or higher. And then finally develop the advanced capabilities to provide future improvements, longer operational lifetime, thus enabling it space solar power to be commercially competitive and broadly adopted in large scale into terrestrial markets. So in conclusion, with a directed program at the national level, space solar power can enable America to become the global leader in clean, safe, renewable, reliable, affordable, distributable, anywhere, anytime energy. Space solar power can power the world and power worlds beyond while moving the world off fossil fuels forever. So you can contact us at info at beyondearth.org or our website beyondearth.org. And at that, I will stop sharing. And I will step in. We have some questions coming in there. <clears throat> from all of us in natural Luddites, we all have to think of the obstacles. <laughs> but one of the things that intrigues me, if this is going to attract people, it's because it does something about the carbon in the atmosphere, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and the whole for sort of fuel cycle. Um, have you got any equations to compare the amount of energy expended because you know, rockets, rocket launchers are not carbon neutral. <laughs> they burn up tremendous amounts of carbon, of, of carbon going up, and they distribute a lot of other, you know, possibly atmospheric warming agents on the way up as well. So do you have some equation where you can amortize that against the benefits of cheap and carbon-free electricity from space afterwards? Yeah, so the answer is, is uh, absolutely. And uh, the, the way that these things are usually discussed for uh, uh, renewable energy sources is in terms of the energy payback time. So, uh, uh -huh. for example, uh, that sounds like the, what I'm looking for. <laughs> yep. So, because of the day night cycle, uh, terrestrial solar, uh, rooftop solar, a, a huge variation depending on the location, the latitude, the weather, 
uh, summer months versus winter months and so on, it can take for, for a rooftop PV system something anywhere from one year to three years to pay back the energy that goes into making the PV array. So it, it so, so let's suppose that you, you put it's two years, it means you install it, you have to wait two years before you generate enough en- power and use that power to equal the amount of energy it took to make the solar array. For a space solar power system, because it's 24 seven, it's 365, the energy payback time is weeks, on order four weeks or so, four or five weeks, depending on the system and depending on the details of the orbit. So rather than years, it's weeks. And that gives you a feeling for how green it is. The the energy that you use, including launch and transportation and deployment, as well as the fabrication of the, the solar rays and all the things that are in the platform, they pay back that energy and become completely carbon zero within about a month. Well, there's a sort of corollary to that as well, by buying in mind what uh, Frank is saying about the amount of hardware up there. Uh, I'm trying to remember what the name was, the, the shields. Uh, the, futurolo- the, the futurologist who worked out we should be looking at stars which are occluded because they're surrounded with energy <laughs> capturing, capturing devices. I forget, what, I forget what the name of it is, but I'm yes. sure you can fill me in. It's, it's a famous science fiction trope. Um, how far are we off that if we get that much stuff in space? Will any sunlight percolate through to the ground? <laughs> well, the, conceptually, if you build a Dyson sphere, that's what that would be. Dyson, that's the one I was looking for. <laughs> yeah. Then you're capturing so, all the sun's energy. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, we are. We are. Uh, we are uh, unfortunately not nearly so ambitious. And, no uh, Dyson and, spheres, and, okay. and 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 of course, the the concept is that the that the solar power satellites would work in conjunction with, in cooperation with terrestrial solar. When, when the sun is shining on the ground or the wind is blowing, obviously you're gonna use terrestrial solar or wind. The key idea with the space solar power system is they complement those. And so the amount of uh, the total capacity, global capacity that would come from space solar, maybe 10%, 15% at most, uh, but that's enough. That's enough to make the difference. Uh, in terms of uh, providing space solar power when ground solar power is not readily available. It would not block the, uh, the sunlight. There'd be <laughs> plenty of sunlight on the ground. But I mean, it, it is a serious point about the, um, uh, about the amount of hardware in orbit. There's big concerns, you know, the various commercial ideas of low orbit uh, internet, the, the astronomers are already shouting about it. And other space launches are there. I mean, it's like sort of driving through Times Square at high speed, isn't it? You've got all sorts of <laughs> hardware hanging about there, all sorts of junk. Uh, is, is there a system to issue parking permits and say, no, you can't have 5,000 satellites there. We have only room for X, Y, or Z. Yeah. yeah. The way it's structured now is each country is responsible for anything that they put up. But... Uh, there are international agreements to make sure that people can bring things down within a certain amount of time, but there's not really any good enforcement. And we didn't really envision sending up tens of thousands of, of devices like we're doing now in low Earth orbit. So clearly we need some better space traffic management, but how that all is going to play out, we definitely need more work on that in the coming time. Now, these satellites themselves will not be in that low Earth orbit uh, clogged mess. John, would you like to talk about that? Well, I just just to highlight. So the and the idea is that these these are large integrated platforms that are assembled from lots and lots of individual pieces. But once they get up there and they get put together robotically, they're not loose. It's not a it's not a cloud of of uh, of small satellites. It's actually all plugged together. Um, so when you when you take the Legos out of the box, you you have to put them together to make whatever it is you're going to make. But once you put them together, then they they stay that way. <laughs> but I mean, how many are we talking about? Uh, you know, the, the Lagrange points. We know X, Y, Z. They are the, the, mm-hmm. so, so many satellites in geosynchronous orbit. How many are you talking here? So each each full scale platform uh, based on the, the the baseline design. 
uh, that exists at the moment would deliver to the ground about two gigawatts, uh, uh, which could be shared among multiple receivers, but each one would deliver about two gigawatts to the ground. Uh, and I think the, the sort of the baseline that we've looked at would be uh, on order uh, 100 to three or 400 of these platforms. So on the order of several hundreds of gigawatts globally, uh, which is uh, frankly still a very small fraction of the total energy. If you, you take the uh, uh, 30,000 kilowatt hours per year times 9 billion people, um, the amount of energy that you need for a modern civilization is, is stupendous. Uh, it's one of the challenges of the coming decades. Um, and the question that several of us are thinking of, bearing in mind that uh, the genesis of this was uh, Star Wars under Ronald Reagan, where these beams were supposed to be hitting other people's satellites, planes, and targets on the ground. Uh, you know, the, the, the James Bond scenario. But, you know, quite apart from, well, that is one aspect. Can this be weaponized by other countries and this country? But also, what happens if uh, this beam is coming down and an aircraft flies through, or the the, the, right. the last the last endangered condor goes through and gets fried en route? What are you going to do? Yeah. So the so uh, may I, Tony? Yes, please. Okay. So um, this is one of the uh, it's it's absolutely one of the fundamental concerns. Goes back to the earliest uh, thinking about solar power satellites. Um, there are, as I said, there are a number of different ways that you can do a solar power satellite, just like there are different ways that you can do aircraft or shipping or uh, almost anything. The, the key uh, parameter to keep in mind is um, the intensity of the wireless power transmission. And so the, uh, if you go out on a hot summer day and you look up at the sun, you're receiving from the sun about 1,000 watts of energy per square meter. So, uh, and that's, that's just the, what sunlight delivers to the earth at noon on a clear summer day. The system that uh, we're proposing could not actually deliver more than about 240, 250 watts per square meter at the exact center of the transmission. And it's a Gaussian distribution. So it would deliver on average about 100 watts per square meter or about 10% of summer sunlight. And the, uh, if, you were, if you were to be exposed by the beam uh, for a relatively short period of time or even a long period of time, you would feel a little warmer. But to the best of our knowledge and the studies that have been done, um, including animal studies and, and uh, humans actually conduct studies on microwave transmission all the time whenever they pick up a mobile phone. Um, there, there are no data su su to suggest that at these power levels, there would be any harm to living organisms. There'd be a little bit of heating, but no, no, uh, no, uh, they don't have the, the wavelength that would allow them to, for example, to break chemical bonds uh, and cause cancer the way that ultraviolet light from the sun causes can skin cancer if you go out and spend all day every day out in the sun. Now, you do have to worry about potential interference with uh, aircraft or other satellites and the, um, the, because it's a radio frequency signal. And there are details with regard to spectrum allocation, which are managed through a group called the International Telecommunications Union to assure that the spectrum, the part of the, the electromagnetic spectrum that we would use is, or which would be used by such systems would not interfere with others. Uh, and we actually have uh, uh, fail-safe plans to assure that the transmission can only be sent to the receiver that it's intended for, the feedback loop, uh, so that it can, can't go to any location that's not asking for it. You mean I can't and if, the power? I'm sorry, no. Uh, you, can't, you can't pirate the power. Uh, and, and if someone were uh, going to fly through it, like an aircraft were going to go through it, so that you can shut the beam off, wait for the aircraft to pass, and then turn it back on again. Uh, and then uh, with a relatively short-term uh, energy storage at the receiver, you can compensate for such uh, uh, short interruptions. 
But I, I actually, I'd like to jump off of what John was saying and point out that um, the, these microwaves are already in use uh, for telecommunications uses. They're used in Doppler radar. They're used in uh, speed detectors um, for, that the police use. So there, there's a lot of uses for these kinds of radio frequency waves. Um, and part of what we would need done is to clear out, to make sure that there wasn't interference between these systems and the, the systems that are using them today. So if it's such low intensity, I presume there must be a really big footprint for the receiving stations. The, so, um... so, right. So the way, to, the way to think about the receiver for a solar power satellite is it's not like putting a, an antenna on your roof like satellite television or something. It's, it's really a lot more like hydroelectric power. So that if you, if you think, for example, about Hoover Dam in the US and Lake Mead, which is behind Hoover Dam, the power generation capacity of Hoover Dam when the lake is full is about two gigawatts. So it's roughly equivalent to one of these solar power satellites that we're describing. But the area, the surface area of the lake I mean, the amount of land that's taken up to provide the water, to drive the power, to, to, to send to Las Vegas, uh, it's, it's something like 150, I don't remember the exact number at this moment, but it's like 150 square um, kilometers for the, for the lake, for two gigawatts. The area for the solar power satellite receiver is like 25 square kilometers. So in, it, it's, it's relatively regular. It's a, a circle or an ellipse, depending on the latitude that it's in. And it's a small fraction of, of a lake of similar size to produce the same kind of power, except that you don't need the rainfall. Can that land, is that land sterilized for other uses or oh, can you use oh, it agriculturally at the same time? Yeah, really, really good question. The, the the concept that we're looking at would involve putting, the receiver would look a lot like um, cyclone fencing, like metal fencing. So it would be largely transparent, um, about 80% transparent. And you put it up about uh, uh, four or five meters above the ground. And underneath, uh, it would be like uh, being under, if you had a pergola in your backyard to sort of provide you with a little bit of sunshade, underneath would still be available for agriculture or, or it could be offshore or pretty much anything that you cared to do with it, but it would get about um, 15, 20% less sunlight than otherwise. Well, in the you desert, rain. yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, the, the, the issue also comes of equity. Uh, does this mean it's going to accentuate the, the idea that, that countries that can't afford satellites and can't afford the expensive gear will therefore fall. You, you, you mentioned the prospects for Africa in terms of the energy drought. Um, does, is this going to exacerbate this distinction? How do you envisage uh, putting it all together, making sure that they can, right. you know, my, my instincts would be it'd be nice for the poor countries to be able to throw a wire over the power transmission the way they do locally. <laughs> so you want to... Speak to well, that. No, that's or... absolutely a, a, an important question. And well, I think one of the points we're trying to make is that we can bring power to the world. And these systems can um, fundamentally alter how, how we think about power in the world, especially at some of these locations. Um, there's, there's no reason that these systems can't provide you know, power locally if you're someplace off the grid. So there's all these communities that need help. There's all these, you know, countries really that um, have real infrastructure problems, and th this can help uh, help alleviate a lot of that that problem. John, you've given this a lot of thought, though, but I'd like to you to chime in here too. Yeah, just just so the it's it's one of the most important aspects of developing space solar power in the way that we're talking about it, i.e., as a as a partnership between government and the private sector and an international. Uh, partnership as well, and to focus on meeting commercial and civil requirements, specifically so that the price of the system can be tractable, uh, no more than like a major hydroelectric plant, uh, which which basically any of the countries in sub-Saharan Afri Africa could, if they had the water, they could finance through, for example, the IMF, 
five, ten billion dollars for a major hydro plant, but they don't have the water, they don't have the territory, they don't have the the terrain. Well, in this case, if these systems turn out the way that we anticipate, then building a two gigawatt power plant would require about uh, eight or ten billion dollars. Now that's a lot of money, but it's less than, for example, um, the Aswan Dam. It's less than uh, a tiny fraction of the Three Gorges Dam in China. It's less than. So these numbers would be tractable. And uh, as uh, I made the argument a moment ago, in conjunction with um, terrestrial solar energy, which could be on rooftops, would allow these countries, the, the lesser developed countries today, to become uh, modern and, and, uh, and wealthy countries with good qualities of life by later in the century with power less than 10 cents a kilowatt hour. Simon uh, Locke has chipped in about the cost comparisons there over short term and long term. Now in power generation, the base loads, the, the one that they rely on all of the time, they turn, people want to keep it as cheap as possible and introduce only call on the more expensive sources when, uh, when they have to, when the, when the, the demand shoots up. Well, what's, how does the solar power base load cost compare with uh, nuclear, thermal, all of the other various forms? Yeah, so very competitive with, um, uh, with uh, existing uh, power plants, uh, cheaper than nuclear, uh, not as cheap as terrestrial solar for intermittent power. But if you actually tried to provide solar power for base load power in Berlin, in Paris, in Tokyo, in Singapore, where it can be overcast and rainy for three or four weeks at a time. And the rest, and the rest. <laughs> and the rest. So any place people live, if they live there because there's water, there's rain, that's overcast. And this is one of the great challenges for achieving carbon zero in the next several decades, because you can't, you can't suddenly say, well, you're going to shut down your economy during the month of December. Uh, and you can't build battery systems and oversize your terrestrial renewable systems by three, four, five, ten times. So that on that one sunny day, uh, December 2nd, you can generate enough energy to put into your batteries for the next two weeks. Um, and, so, and so if you had a solution where you could call up uh, dispatchable green energy, provide it for those two weeks, and then switch it from Berlin to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, Cairo or to wherever, um, that becomes a really attractive option. I don't think Cairo worries much about rainstorms. Uh, they actually have, yeah. they have their own monsoon but, season. It's not yes, much, <laughs> but they do have their monsoon season. Sure. <laughs> so, but uh, this is, uh, are, there, are there any provisions for storage in space or does it have to come down to the ground to get stored? Are you? Oh, down to the ground, down to the ground. Yeah. Batteries are batteries are heavy and expensive. Mm -hmm, quite. I was wondering whether you had any thoughts on the systems up there and how to do it. Um, here we are at another one. Um, where are we? Sorry, it's uh, partly occluded by the next question. <laughs> uh, regionally adaptive systems should be used where it makes economic sense. However, base load power, base load power needs to be addressed in all markets for all days, as well as dispatchable sources. I presume you're going to agree with that from Gary Barnard. Uh, it, it's, it's true. It's true. And also, and also not just uh, uh, the daytime, but also um, if you, if you look at the one location may have wonderful solar in, in the middle of summer, uh, but in the middle of December, it has terrible solar. And so there, there will be seasonal adjustments and, and tailoring as well. Yeah, and the point about these areas that would be used for reception is that they would tend to be remote. Um, you know, I don't think anyone's going to give over Central Park for a solar receiver or, you know. <laughs> it, so the, you, the, does this all include the transmission costs from the reception site to um, the point of use? Uh, the, the financial numbers uh, absolutely include the the end-to-end -end costs, the, the fabrication, the launch, the deployment, the transmission, and the receiving system integration to the grid. Um, 
and and absolutely all of those things have to be done. Uh, so, like I said, you you wouldn't anticipate putting a lake in the middle of of New York City either. There is and one. So you, there is one. I've seen it. In well, no, no, no. It's a pond. It's a pond. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> But, uh, but you think if you again, if you think of it like you think about it like hydro, but hydro where you can basically choose where you want to put the lake and you still get to use the land underneath. Mm -hmm. And it, it, so New York just recently uh, closed down the nuclear power plant that was supplying a significant portion at, of it. At Indian Point, yes. Yeah. So, but Indian Point was not in New York City. I mean, it was upriver. So. Hey, it, uh, if any missile had hit it, it would have been in New York City in bits. <laughs> <laughs> but but I think John's John's point is valid that it, it, it needs to be close by when you're doing something like a city. So you yeah. don't have to displace populations. Yeah. To, to I actually I actually rather I, I I there's a lot of work that would need to be done. A place that I think it's actually very attractive is a lot of these places where they've done large scale um, uh, uh, coal mining. It would be a way of rehabilitating the land where these areas are quite similar to uh, to the receiving sites that we're talking about, and would be a thing that you could do that would help rehabilitate and make those uh, locations, for example, in West Virginia, still centers of energy production in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Can you see the question from Gary Barnard or the contribution? Power sharing is analogous to the problem of transport between reception sites and the point of use. Up to 400 miles in standard yeah. utility yeah. practice. Yep, exactly. So as I said, so like, like for example, West Virginia would be within a uh, very typical range for uh, uh, to provide power to either New York or to Chicago. Yeah, which existing systems already do, of course. Exactly. Yeah, but um, I, I don't know. Have you have you checked the reliability of those systems yet? This country's oh, third world. It is powered. Well, and they're all fossil fuel based, based at the moment, or at least large. Yes. Yeah, but the grid the grid is there needs to be upgraded but the but the um the the question is how do we get off the um the carbon habit and do it in just a little while okay right. stanley corn wants to know and we're getting into the technicalities now unless the transmitting satellites are in geostationary orbit they will not remain fixed with respect to the receiving sites how do you plan to direct the beams to the reception sites yeah so so the concept and the technology uh, which has been developed and, and pursued over the last uh, 25 years uh, involves a thing which is called a retrodirective phased array. So the, the concept would be that you, the transmitting system is an active phased array like a, like a, a radar, but instead of being able to point at tar targets that are not cooperating, instead you have a beacon at the site of the receiving antenna. And that beacon sends a signal to the platform. That signal is necessary to uh, basically orchestrate the transmission from many, many, many individual satellite elements. And then the beam is created as a coherent beam and sent at the relatively low intensity that we spoke about to and only to the receiver that it's supposed to um, send it to. And so it's a it's a uh, it's a little bit like a uh, like a spotlight, uh, but only pointing at the location that is called for it. Mm -hmm. And John, can you touch on just what orbits are ideal oh, for? Yeah. So we so uh, we absolutely have looked at um, geostationary Earth orbits because of the because it's a uh, because of the active phased array. You don't actually have to be in the precise geostationary Earth orbit, the, because the beam is uh, not being mechanically pointed, but rather actively electronically steered to the site where the beacon is coming from. So as a consequence, you can also be in what's called a geosynchronous Earth orbit or others uh, that are near geostationary Earth orbit um, uh, for the operational system. We've also looked at uh, lower orbits, middle Earth orbits uh, for some of the demonstrations. Uh, because it would make the um, the, the overall uh, cost of a large-scale demo uh, more affordable. Any more um, any more thoughts? I was just thinking as we went to Arthur C. Clarke invented the uh, geosynchronous satellite or proof of concept. I don't think he made a dime out of it, did he? he, didn't, he, he didn't, no, he didn't no, it was a good idea though. <laughs> But he wrote science fiction, which hardly made a dime either. 
Um, <laughs> he was one of the founders of the British Interplanetary Society, which was established in my own city of Liverpool. He and Olive Stapleton and a few others have uh, I've got fond memories of all of this. Oh, and it's and it's uh, the uh, the the uh, BIS is still thriving. I have many good friends at the uh, BIS, and have published in the the journal BIS. Mm, that's, uh, the, the trouble is that the British government thinks that the BIS is BS and has never given any money. <laughs> <to them. laughs> well, we mentioned in the last program that uh, they they approached the War Office in 1939, say, about military use of rockets, and we're told they saw no foreseeable use of it <laughs> uh, just before the V2 started coming in. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Van von Braun. <laughs> very, very insightful. <laughs> that's that's, that's uh, the military governments for you. <laughs> um, any other questions coming here? Do you have any extra points to round all of this up? Because, I mean... It, the point about my Arthur C. Clarke anecdote was just how far it's come. He produced it at what at the time seemed like a science fictional concept. And uh, to show my age, uh, we had a recently acquired television. And I think I got up early in the morning to watch the, the um, Telsat mm. broadcasts, television broadcasts across the Atlantic for the first time. Mm. Telstar, Telstar, that was it. Telstar, and, uh, yep. Yeah, you know, wiggly black and white images. And this was, you know, this was almost science fiction. It was on a par with teleportation at the time, <laughs> I think. But uh, it, it shows the progress of technology and what is there. And uh, we should be deservedly sceptical about these things. But at the same time, we should be open-minded and realise that uh, what seems impossible, uh, and one ear looks like magic is in the other side, science and practicable. Yeah. And uh, yeah. 10 years ago, this didn't look economically feasible. And now it does. And 10 years from now, it could be, you know, proven out, demonstrated and put into use. So yeah. it could be superseded by something even more. Oh, you never know. <laughs> Sorry, we would the, welcome that as well. <laughs> <laughs> Don't put your pension fund in the one satellite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, Simon Locke is putting in another sort of note of caution. Are there things that keep you up at night about the uses of the technology, which I think comes to my weaponization subject and, um, or, you know, even inadvertent um, may mishaps? What keeps me up at night is that people might not take it seriously. So, um, John, yeah. you have an answer? I, 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 so I, I have good, good colleagues uh, working with the uh, Chinese Academy of Space Technology, and they take it seriously and they're working on it. And uh, I would say the, the number one thing that keeps me concerned, and that's, I always sleep well, so I, I don't stay up at night, hopefully, but um, is that is very along the line, very much along the lines that Tony mentioned that, that we, meaning the, the group of democracies, won't develop this for commercial and civil applications, and that it will be developed by others. It is being developed by others. And that they will essentially control not just ener green energy globally for Earth, but also affordable and um, uh, essentially limitless energy in space uh, with all the space activities that depend on power. Um, and uh, I would very much rather see the, um, the U.S. and our allies and friends uh, be the ones who develop it. Mm -hmm. Gary Barnard again refers to the Lunar Surface Innovation Consortium, LSIC presentation on a visual arc on so space solar power and ancillary services beaming. So if you all want to look at that, we can we can put <laughs> out for people afterwards. It's um no, it it's well, it's science fiction becoming science fact. It's always a it's always a, a reassuring prospect and um no radiation in space from this, at least. Um, hold on, there's another question just come in. Um, that's a point. Uh, how can this technology be harnessed for transport applications? I was about to ask you, sort of lifting up by its own bootstraps, can this power the lift vehicles? And, and this <laughs> was actually looked at, this was actually uh, looked at as an idea by one of the inventors of microwave wireless power transmission. Uh, his name was Bill Brown. He was at the Raytheon Corporation 
Uh, and I should also do a shout out for, of course, uh, 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 Peter Glazer, who invented the idea of the solar power satellite. But he, he called it transport, uh, Bill Brown called it transportronics. And the idea is, is entirely valid. That once you put up one or two solar power satellites, then you can use the solar power satellites to beam energy to the transportation vehicles that are bringing up the rest. And as you start to proliferate these systems in space, you could also use them to drive down the cost and increase the cost effectiveness of transportation everywhere in cis lunar space, the earth moon space. Um, there's no reason you couldn't put these systems, for example, in orbit around Mars, anywhere where the sun shines, uh, and then use them to drive fast and efficient electric propulsion uh, better than you can do with solar uh, anywhere between Earth and Mars. So there, there's a lot of transportation applications. They're not very useful for getting things up into space because the power density is kept low so that they'll be safe. And, and it takes a lot of power to get out of Earth's gravity, so. Yeah. Um one of the other pieces of that is uh, electrifying the vehicles. So electric cars, electric trains, electric airplanes they're working with now. Ships, so, it strikes me as and, the most feasible. And then the best production of electricity becomes this, it becomes enabling for all of those transportation services. So, sorry. <laughs> no, I was just thinking, I, I was looking at the transport systems and I was thinking that uh, a, a, a large container ship might be a big enough receiver to get the energy from space after all yeah uh, <laughs> you can, if there's there's a stupendous amount of power inside a diesel engine <laughs> that's why they get hot i mean that yes. so and it's okay, hardly I, I used to work on the railroad and i've been in those so, engine rooms <laughs> they're noisy you know exactly what i'm talking dirty. about um, so one of the actual early dod uh, use cases was looking at forward deployed bases, forward deployed military bases, and they have to sort of truck in all of their fuel. So if you have this kind of system that could be deployed with that, they thought that that, A, it makes logistics easier, and B, it's a, just a good approach. You don't have to worry about leaving things behind and dealing with all of that sort of thing. John, uh, you, you're more up to date on their uh, the current uh, state of the well, it's with those two. Yeah, the same thing, same thing is very much true with remote industrial applications like mining, for example, or smelters. Uh, but in, if for, in the case of both military applications and um, like forward operating bases and mining operations, those uh, organizations are trying to make the transition from petroleum vehicles where you've got to ship in uh, diesel fuel at great cost and great risk to electric vehicles that can peri be periodically recharged, not, not beaming the power to them while they're moving, but charge them, for example, uh, when, they're, when they're in the service pool, you charge them up and then they're good for three or 400 miles. Well, that kind of strategy is, is, uh, is very amenable to space solar power systems. But, um, but uh, that in, in those kinds of applications, you don't care so much about the cost per kilowatt hour because it's a military purpose and, and you're trying to not lose lives to explosive devices. And so three, four dollars a kilowatt hour is not an unthinkable price. But, but for our proposition and to do something about global affordable green energy, you've got to be down at, at a dime, at 10 cents per kilowatt hour or less, not a dollar a kilowatt hour or more. Okay, well, coming to the green, I think we're coming to the end of the clock. Um, Caitlin, do you have the Chiron for what's coming up? I'd like to thank you both. Uh, this is Tony Tutora and John Mankins from Beyond Earth Institute, uh, expounding on the practicability, and I say that as a, not, not with a question mark, of space-generated uh, energy. And uh, we've, this is the second we've had with Beyond Earth Institute, uh, a thank you out there to Steve Wolf, who made it all possible by introducing us. Um, and forthcoming briefings. Similar, we have a UN Food Systems Summit with Marianne Nestle and uh, questions being asked in Africa about whether uh, 
fertilizer and green revolution type uh, industrial agriculture is really the answer. Uh, we're going to look at the US, Russia, China critical triangle. Uh, we have reminiscences from Tom Osborne, um, ABC correspondent about his decade working with Peter Jennings, the veteran foreign correspondent. And uh, we've got Shashi Taro from India coming soon. Uh, it'd be in time probably to talk to us about uh, all sorts of things about India. Uh, one of them might be India's bid yet again for a permanent Security Council seat. So please register, join, look up, hey, donate as well if you want. But we are looking, we're always looking for subjects uh, that would interest. Please, uh, please drop us a line and introduce us. This one has been really good. Uh, we could say we're in orbit about it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Uh, you know, next week we, we, we introduce the Vulcan Space Command <laughs> <laughs> on a passing visit. But thanks very much, Tony and 